Hi, welcome to Secret Wargamer channel. I uh, just want to show you a game I've been playing recently. It's called The Fall of the Third Reich. It's uh, designed by Ted Racer and published by Campus Games. Uh, the game covers the second part of the war in Europe. Um, it's, it starts July, August 43 and ends May, June 45, so 12 turns. Um, the game comes with uh, a double size map. Right, I'll just move that so you can see. Two paper maps, each 22 by uh, 34 inches, um, with a small overlap. You can see it's only about a hex or so. And it covers uh, Europe from as far east as uh, Kharkov and Kursk uh, to the west with Brittany, and in the south it goes as far as uh, Sicily and Greece. If you play uh, the historic uh, campaign then uh, the, the game starts with a mandatory uh, German attack on Kursk, which I just about show there, and uh, the Allies will land in Sicily. Non-historical scenario sure how different it, it would be. The setup is the same. The units are set up in a predefined uh, order of battle and location. Uh, it's quite smart actually. Each unit has, if you see the top right hand corner there, has a setup location uh, there, uh, which obviously corresponds to one of the numbered hexes uh, on the map. So what else comes with it? Um, you get three uh, double-sided uh, player aid cards on a kind of like thin card stock. Um, I've run a couple through the copier and, and laminated them just to just to keep my original safe. Uh, the rule book runs about thirty-five pages, although a chunk, a fair chunk of that is a really useful um, example of play. Uh, as you can see it's full colour and it's on that kind of a matte sort of finish rather than glossy paper uh, for those of you that, uh, that are interested in that sort of thing. Uh, so for a game that covers the strategic uh, level of the war uh, in, in Europe it, it's very straightforward I think, um, well I found it to be so. The, uh, the rules are pretty easy to read uh, and to follow, examples of player good, and of course, Board Game Geek is always a great uh, source of answers to, to questions you may have. Uh, there's a few pieces of errata, and those are also published on Board Game Geek. Let me show you some of the features of the map. Um, as you can see, there's basic turn record track, uh, units that are available, units that have been uh, destroyed. Uh, these relate to kind of like uh, German headquarters uh, units, which are key to play. The Germans have to uh, route command and control through HQs. You have to units have to be within range uh, to attack. They need to be in range as well to perform certain types of movement. It's called exploitation movement. Uh, we have here. Uh, hexes that are outlined in red, those are victory point hexes. Uh, and these ones with these kind of like uh, cog wheels also represent um, factory locations. Uh, and the German replacement uh, factors are dependent on uh, those factory hexes. Um, they receive a multiple um, per uh, hex. Uh, and the, the hex has to be in supply and whatever. I won't go into the detail. Uh, but essentially, the Allies have opportunities in the air part of the game, which is slightly abstract, but they have opportunities to bomb these hexes. And depending on how much damage they do, uh, that affects the German rate of replacement. Uh, the Allies, Western Allies, on the other hand, and the Soviets, uh, have a set rates for re replacement points based on the year that we're playing. Um, let's show you these. These are beachhead locations 
And according to rule book, they represent the first mile or so of the hex that's being invaded. Uh, let's find another example. So for example, um, oh, yeah, this one's south of Rome. So that, that um, represents the beachhead that was used for Anzio. Um, they're landing here, as you can see, in a marsh. You put on, when you're doing your invasion, I won't go into it in too much detail, but you use these beachhead markers. I guess you can point them whatever way you like. Um, up until June 44, you can only attack with two core out of one of these. But basically, you, you would stack up your invading forces along with any um, paratroop support and this is the hex that you would be invading now interesting and one of the things I, I really like about this game actually is uh, you don't just add up your uh, various combat factors uh, when invading you use this table okay so based on uh, terrain um, whether there's a axis unit or two units in the hex um, whether you've got air cover whether you're using paratroopers they all provide uh, die roll modifiers so if you roll a modified roll of a one it's a failed invasion um, two to three you're hanging on by your fingernails so uh, I've had one or two of those four or five is a success I, I would imagine this is this is kind of like the d-day result in in real life and a six is an overwhelming success where the allies can do quite a, a serious advance and, a, and another attack after landing um, oh here's the uh, replacement table i mentioned uh, earlier as you can see 43 44 45 and these are the number of points that uh, you get for uh, each turn in terms of replacements and I tell you, you need them because the combat results table is uh, is pretty brutal. Here's some example counters. Uh, as you can see, uh, Soviets are in their sort of classic red colour. Uh, we've got a, a mechanised unit here, and as is, I guess, pretty standard in these games. You can see it's four X's, so it's a an army. Um, attack factor, defence factor, movement factor. Um, these things can shift but of course bear in mind that each turn is two months so you'd expect them to shift um, there's the uh, setup Ooh, get some focus there's the setup uh, coordinate that I mentioned earlier um, we've got a British mechanized uh, unit here you see the little letter E I don't know if you can make that out actually in the top right hand corner that shows that it starts in the England holding box. So that's getting ready to attack in uh, Northwest Europe. Uh, uh, what else have we got? Here's a French mechanized mountain core. Uh, it uh, turns up on turn three, uh, top right hand corner. And the M is the Mediterranean holding box. So that would uh, be used either in Italy or attacking uh, south of France. You can move um, units between the Med and uh, England, but you can't move from England back to the Med. So it's something to think about when you're uh, distributing your forces and getting ready for um, D-Day and uh, whatnot. And uh, again, here's a, the US third mechanized, uh, sorry, second mechanized, and again, it starts life in, in the med. A couple of other interesting uh, counters here. Um, got one over here, actually, nearly lost you. So here's a fort, and as you can see, like other counters, it has its uh, initial setup location. Uh, all forts start on the map. Okay, so even lines like defensive lines that perhaps came into effect in 1944 in Italy are already on the map. And the explanation that I've read for that is that it, it saves a big overhead uh, on building fort rules, etc. Um, not sure. I'm not sure how difficult it is to actually uh, uh, give a, a unit a, a small penalty for stopping to, to 
uh, build a fort, but there you go. So they start set up, which you might like or you might not. Forts, by their nature, give uh, defensive shifts, so they're, they're, they're useful, particularly in Italy, where you have them you know, stretched out across, across the peninsula. Uh, I, I kind of showed that earlier. This is a beachhead hex. That big number two in brackets is because uh, up, until, up until the end of turn five, you can only invade with two core. But from turn six, you flip it over and you can stack up to three core. Uh, paras uh, can stack for free uh, up to a maximum of two. And the normal kind of you know, restrictions between US and other allied forces in terms of stacking, i.e. they can't. You can combine to attack, but you can't stack together, um, except for the French. The French, free French unit does can stack with the Americans. Uh, yeah, that's probably about it. Um, three combat units can stack, uh, plus, um, I think it's two divisions. I'd have to check. So the divisions, you can, you can stack three core or three army, and then there's, I think, one or two divisions you can stack on top of that, which can lead to a pretty potent force. Um, so here's an example of a, an HQ unit, and the Germans have something like eight points that they can spend on HQ units, and they split between the West, OKW, and there's the equivalent for the East, OKH. Uh, these are critical, absolutely critical for the Germans. You'll see the number in the top right hand corner, two and town. So that means this uh, HQ has a, 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 a command radius of two hexes from a town. Flick it over and it's doubled from a city. So it gives you quite a, an extensive range. And believe me, that's important because as I mentioned earlier, it enables units to do certain things uh, like retreat from, oh sorry, withdraw from an enemy hex, that, you know, an enemy zone of control, so non, a non-mechanised unit could do that. Uh, a mechanised unit would need to be in range to execute um, exploitation movement uh, and so on. Now these you, you keep them on the town side when they're, when they're in their holding box. So they go one to four. So obviously the, uh, the marker, the HQ with a four marker here would have, oops, thrown it away, would have a, an eight radius from a city. And that's pretty important when you've got a bit of a scarcity of towns and cities, for example, coming over to this other map. And you, you start looking at uh, Russia and some of these towns and cities are pretty pretty spread out and I think that's one of the keys to bear in mind when you're playing as the Soviet uh, you've got to plan your offensives and, and really aim to take major cities uh, you also want to kind of punch holes in the German line so that you can exploit and get behind them and, and try and occupy towns and cities but the last game I played, which was much more successful for the Soviets, um, I just basically got the steamroller going and uh, forgot about using them to try and punch through. It just, just really attritioned the, the German army to death. And, uh, but, you know, as I say, you've got to bear these, these points in mind. Grab the, the cities. Allied supply is uh, handled through these counters, uh, Schaaf markers. Uh, that number three indicates how many hexes, either from uh, the beachhead or a port town or city, it can supply units for. So if we were to put this one in, in Naples, Naples has got a, a special ability, so this times four simply means that whatever strength shafe unit you put in here, its, it's supply range is, is four times what's printed. So this one with about a supply units that are sort of 12 hexes away. And you have to trust me on that, that gets you up somewhere near Milan. Um, so you do need to take some more cities, uh, sorry, some more ports as the Allied, if you want to get as far as 
actually taking Milan and then trying to perhaps push into Germany through the Alps and whatnot. Of course, that becomes even more critical for the Allies when they uh, have made their D-Day invasion. So capturing port towns, uh, oh, Schoenberg doesn't show up so well because it's all green, uh, and port cities becomes very important because the Allies simply run out of supplies. They can't, they can't advance uh, as, as, as they would wish. And you end up perhaps with a narrow front and it's quite a challenge actually. It's, um, I felt that that gave a good feel to the game and to the, the, uh, the challenges that the, uh, that the uh, Western Allies had. Similarly to Naples, you'll see Antwerp here uh, also has uh, a multiplier. Um, so five times whatever shape value you put in there, so then you really can get into uh, into the heart of uh, the heart of the Reich. Uh, small map um, error. There's a Marata somewhere, and one of these hexes I can't remember which one it is should have a letter A in it, and that means that the Allies also have to take that hex in order to open Antwerp as a port, which makes sense because you had the battles around the Schwelt, and that 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 would reflect that. Let me tell you a little bit about the sequence of play. It's, it's quite involved, okay? So there's something like 18 steps or phases within the sequence of play. Don't let that put you off. Um, these are all in a very logical sequence. And, and what it means is that players aren't sitting around doing nothing um, while the other player gets to move and attack and blow holes in your line. There, there's essentially a, a move and combat phase. Um, so, I don't know, you, you can do your operation, your, your main moves and combat. The other player, non-phasing player, gets to react to that. And there's rules covering, you can move certain units to cover gaps in the line or launch a counter-attack. Um, the phasing player would, would then go back to them and they'd have an opportunity for exploitation movement. So it's interactive. You're not um, sitting there doing nothing. You need to keep a good eye on what your opponent's doing so that you can react to it and um, really, you know, not, not, not just sit there passively. Um, one of the things I found, because I play most of my games solo, is it can be a bit hard work just keeping uh, all of the sequencing right, the different steps, you need a bit of patience to work your way through it. But that patience is rewarded. Um, it's a rewarding game. It's a challenging game. I, I was kind of slightly concerned that the axis would just be um, you know, a punch bag and uh, it would be a foregone conclusion that the allies would win. Well, the first couple of games, I really struggled as the Allies, uh, or the Allies really struggled. Um, the Germans can counterattack quite effectively. If they're smart with their use of armour, they can protect key cities and make it difficult for the Soviets to uh, stay within that all-important command range uh, and kind of launch some counterattacks to, to, to blunt the Soviets. Um, that's not to say that the, the Germans are going to be able to turn it around and, uh, and take Moscow. Um, that's not going to happen. Well, not unless the Soviet player is really hopeless. Um, but other opportunities certainly arise when the Western Allies uh, try to land in France. Uh, I managed to hang on by the skin of my teeth in the first game I played, landing in Normandy. Um, I then went on later, I played um, an invasion of, um, well, just, just uh, west of Brittany. Um, and that, that, that presented other struggles. Got ashore okay, but then trying to reinforce and supply was a challenge in itself. And of course, those poor guys that were slogging their way up Italy. The soft underbelly that... Uh, uh, Churchill called it, and uh, I think um, Clark, the US commander, called it the tough old gut. Anyhow, enough burbling from me. Uh, I hope this has given you a, a bit of a, a view of this of this game. I like it, 
Um, it's published by Campus Games, as I said. Certainly available in the UK. Uh, a little bit pricey, I thought. It was something like £73 I paid for it, which I would compare that to the price I would pay for, say, a coin game from GMT. Um, so, a bit pricey, but a good game. I enjoy it. It's going to come back to the table pretty soon. And um, if you have any questions on it or you want to ask anything, just, just post your comments uh, after this video. Thanks for your patience. I hope you've enjoyed it.